So much of our study of the atom has focused on what's happening with the electrons. Now we're going to focus our attention on the nucleus. Because we're going to focus on the nucleus so much, we're going to come to an understanding of something called nuclear notation, which is really a way of communicating what the constituent parts or what's inside the nucleus. We all know, I think at this point, that the nucleus consists of two major particles, protons and neutrons, and nuclear notation will help us know the number of those. So here's the general way nuclear notation works. Um, the big, most prominent thing we, we identify is the chemical symbol shown here as an X in this generic form. Then we put a number on the top left here, uh, which is the atomic mass number of the particular nucleus that we are studying. Remember, every nucleus has the potential to have isotopes. So this number could be different for different elements. On the other hand, the atomic number, the number found on the bottom left here, is really for any given element, a consistent number. It's the number of protons. And this is something you can take to the bank and always know all the time. It really is what defines an element. Uh, on the other hand, the atomic mass number could change depending on which isotope of an element we're looking at. And here's an example down here. So here's two uh, stable, relatively stable uh, isotopes of carbon. So we could have the carbon that has six protons and a total uh, mass number of 14. So when we talk about mass number, we'll just remind you of this. This is the number of protons plus neutrons. So in this case, this isotope of carbon has six protons uh, and eight neutrons. Contrast that to carbon 12, this one that has six protons identified here and six neutrons as identified by the fact that it has a 12 for its atomic mass number. So by giving um, this nuclear notation, we can communicate not real, not, it's not totally obvious, I guess, because uh, we're not coming right out and saying how many neutrons, but it's not too hard to, to determine the number of protons and the number of neutrons in a given nucleus. And you'll see that it's a good way to distinguish between isotopes. With that in mind, I will also say this, when we talk about these different isotopes, and we want to write them maybe in a sentence form, we would call this one carbon 14. We would just write it as that. That tells us everything we need to know. It's carbon with its six protons on our periodic table. And 14 will be the total number of, I'll throw another term that I may use and you may hear sometime. Sometimes people call these nucleons, the protons and neutrons are the nucleons. So this would be carbon 14. 14 nucleons, 14 protons plus neutrons, as opposed to this one over here, which is carbon 12, we would call it. So because we're dealing with uh, atomic physics, really what's happening at the nuclear level, what's happening within the nucleus, and we're gonna look at nuclear reactions, we need to clearly communicate specific isotopes, specific nucleuses. It's not chemistry anymore, people. So to begin to understand uh, changes in the nucleus and uh, nuclear reactions, we should understand forces in the nucleus. And if you consider this picture here, if we have a nucleus and it's made up of protons and neutrons, and we'll just randomly pick one to be protons, we'll say these blue particles are protons, so they're all positively charged and they have some mass. And then you have your neutrons, which are, I won't label those, those neutrons which are uh, neutral, the red particles, then there's definitely two forces at play in the nucleus. One force will try and keep these particles together, and that would be the force of gravity. So if we imagine a force of gravity trying to pull together these two neighboring protons and neutrons, and that would happen for all these particles because the force of gravity uh, acts between any two objects with mass, so there's an attractive force there. But uh, at certain between certain particles, there's also a repulsive force. Imagine the two forces between two neighboring protons. There's going to be an electrostatic force that's going to try and push them apart. 
turns out that if those were the only two forces, the force of gravity is much less than the electrostatic force. So the electrostatic force really should win in this contest of keeping things together or pushing them apart. The pushing apart forces really should be winning here. So the question became, why are these nuclei from, you know, for the most part, why are nuclei stable? And the reason is that there's another force called the strong nuclear force or the strong force. Some people will refer to it as, and that strong force is a force that acts uh, between these neighboring particles as well. And it's an attractive force that exists at short range. So the key features of the strong nuclear force is that it exists between any two nucleons. So it could be between proton, proton, neutron, neutron, but it could also be between proton, neutron. It is an attractive force only. Um, Make sure that that's clear. It's not like electrostatics that can be pushes or pulls. And here's the key thing that makes it unique. It acts at extremely close range only. In other words, if I have a proton here and a proton here at a distance, these two protons will electrostatically repel each other. And because they're far apart, maybe not close enough together, the strong nuclear force doesn't really exist between them. Now, if those protons get close enough together, then they get a stronger electrostatic force because that depends on how far apart they are. But we may also get close enough together that we can get an attractive force between these two things, right? So equal and opposite attractive forces. So once you get close together, so one good analogy to think about when it comes to the strong nuclear force it is to think of the strong nuclear force like a bungee cord. And so you may have two things that don't want to get together, but if they get close enough together to hook a little bungee cord between the two of them, now that bungee cord can keep the forces repelling them at bay. And so you can keep it together with this bungee cord, but move far enough apart, the bungee cord breaks, and now the electrostatic force of repulsion wins. Now, the result of these different forces, and I haven't talked much about the force of gravity because it is so slight that it's really almost non-existent, almost non-existent. But in the end, we come up with this kind of concept of nuclear stability, this idea that there's always a conflict between the forces that are trying to rip the nucleus apart and forces trying to hold it together. And so we never say that something is either stable or not stable. That's not that. Uh, that two side, it's not that uh, clear cut. We have this range of stability, these relative stabilities of atoms or relative stability of nuclei. And turns out that certain configurations of protons and neutrons are more stable than others. And it doesn't really have, I mean, it's partly got to do with number, but it's mostly this idea of configuration. Certain combinations of protons and neutrons turned out to be more stable than others. So it's not like a big uh, nucleus is less stable and small ones are more stable necessarily. This chart kind of gives you an idea of nuclear stability and you see this chart quite often when you look at uh, nuclear reactions. And it basically says, um, you know, here on the, on the bottom axis, you have atomic mass number. So smaller nuclei will be on this end. And then as we go along here, we get into the larger nuclei on this end. And so, yeah, there is kind of a trend that happens at first that as you get larger and larger, you get more and more stable. So this is this is uh, a term we'll use later on. It's called binding energy. But you can think of this as just kind of becoming more stable as you go top, to the top here. So there is kind of a pattern, but it, it jumps around a little bit here. It's kind of unique. And this is because of these certain configurations that some things have a little bit better configuration than others, even though their sizes. Are. So it's not an absolute, like, Oh, as you get bigger, you get more stable or smaller, more stable. There is a general trend that when small nuclei can become larger, they get more stable. And on this side of the uh, hill, large nuclei, if they could get smaller, become more stable. But there's kind of this most stable nuclei that have this 
special configuration somewhere around here, this iron 56, the most stable. But in your mind, just consider as we go through our studies with uh, nuclear reactions that every nucleus has a certain degree of stability and eventually could be bumped around enough to fall apart while others are really stable and can last for tens of thousands of years and maybe millions of years. Others can last for fractions of seconds. So understanding that idea, this leads us to the idea of radioactive decay. So atoms, like anything in this world, like there is a general pattern in chemistry, physics, and in the sciences that things want to go from less stable to more stable, from high energy to low energy. And nuclear reactions, natural nuclear reactions, are a consequence of this. So when you have these really large nucleus, if they can become more stable by spitting out uh, some of their particles, then they'll do that. And that's what you're seeing in this animation here. So we're going to take a little survey of some natural radioactive decay. Each one of the decays that we talk about is really nature's way of taking atoms from a less stable state to a more stable state. If we go back in that uh, diagram uh, on the previous slide, uh, it's nature's way of trying to move things to this more stable configuration up here. So there are four kinds of natural decay, um, and they're all named, they were named by the Greek alphabet, basically A, B, and C, alpha, beta, gamma, based on their, originally their penetrating power. So if you take a look, this is a alpha particle. Alpha particles can penetrate through a few sheets of paper, so they were given the designation A or alpha. Uh, this is a beta negative particle. I'm going to make a distinction here. This is beta negative. Um, so this is common. It's, it's referred to as a beta negative, but most people would just call it a beta particle. Uh, this is a rare particle down here called a beta positive. Um, so if you hear the term beta, it's going to be a beta negative. If you hear beta positive, it refers to a slightly different version of the beta particle. So we have alpha, we have beta or beta negative, we have beta positive, and then gamma. And again, if you look at the penetrating power, with the exception of this beta positive, it's a very unique particle as you'll see later on. Uh, as you get move from alpha A to beta B to gamma C, as you go through ABC, you just get more and more penetrating power. So the ability for these particles to get through materials. Um, alpha is not very good at getting through materials. Beta is a little better. Gamma is the best. The charge on an alpha particle is 2 plus. The charge on a beta negative is 1 negative. And when I talk about 1 or 2 positive negative, I'm talking about the elementary charge. So this would be two times the elementary charge to the positive. This would be one times the elementary charge, but to the negative, negative one E. This would be positive one E, and this would be neutral. So we sometimes put the little uh, charges on them, but um, these are the charges on each of these different decay particles. And finally, the mass of these decay particles, you can look these up on your periodic table data sheet. Alpha particle is 6.65 .6 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Beta, well, this one may be familiar, 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. This one is also 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. And gamma, no mass. So I'm going to tell you about the beta negative and the gamma, the two ones that should be familiar to you right now. What people identified or better yet weren't sure about when they first investigated radioactive decay and they decided to call a beta negative particle turns out is an electron. So they are the same. Now you're going to use the term beta negative because then we know it's a nuclear reaction that created this uh, particle, but it is an electron. Gamma, some people call it a gamma particle. Turns out a gamma 
particle really is a photon, those things that have uh, energy but no mass. Alpha particle we've been dealing with before. Um, turns out that if you want to try a little trick here, take this number and divide by four, and you will find that this has the same mass as four either protons or neutrons. And doing a little detective work, you can figure out that an alpha particle is really a combination of two protons and two neutrons fused together. And if you uh, think to your studies in chemistry, you'll recognize that as really a nucleus of helium. So it's like a helium nucleus. And sometimes you'll see people write it like that. I'm not a big fan of that. I like to call it what it is, which is an alpha particle. It's got the same configuration as a helium nucleus. But again, by calling it an alpha, beta, or gamma particle, we make a distinction between something that we might find in nature somewhere else and something that's been created because of a nuclear event, because of a change in a nucleus, and these are emitted from the nucleus through a nuclear pro process. So I think if you call it a helium nu nucleus, you might just think of somebody making or finding helium naturally occurring in the world. Alpha particle tells me it's coming from a nucleus, from a larger nucleus. All right, so all of this is leading us to a skill that um, if you picked up the first couple ideas, the idea of nuclear notation and the idea of uh, the different kinds of decay particles that can happen in nuclear reactions, then we are going to start practicing writing nuclear equations. And nuclear equations take those two understandings about uh, writing nuclear notation and understanding the different uh, decay particles and borrows a little bit from chemistry because like a chemical reaction, nuclear reactions must obey the law of conservation of mass and the law of conservation of charge. In other words, whatever we start with at the beginning for mass and charge, we're gonna have it at the end, which makes nuclear equations, in my mind, very logical, very linear, and dare I say, very easy if you understand the basic principles. So let's revisit this animation with alpha decay. So in alpha decay, you imagine this large nucleus that gives off this alpha particle. Now you can see the alpha particle here, and they've used green and orange to color code their protons and neutrons. And so there's our alpha particle, two protons and two neutrons. And then they give this generic form here. It goes away pretty quick, um, but you can, you can pause it at some point and see what it actually says. Um, but it says that, you well, We'll do an example and then you can revisit their example and see exactly what's going on. So let's do this example. So typical question that you would be expected to predict the product of would be a nuclear reaction in which uranium-238 undergoes alpha decay. So let's start like a chemical reaction. We'll write down what we start with, what you might call the reactants, what we're going to call uranium-238. I'm going to call this, start giving you some terminology, make you sound intelligent. This is called the parent nuclei, the thing we are going to start with. So there's our parent nuclei. It's uranium-238, and we're going to write the nuclear notation for it. Check it out. Look it up on your periodic table. I think you'll find that the number of protons or the atomic number for uranium-238 is 92. So we start with uranium-238, and we're told it undergoes alpha decay. Now, like a chemical reaction, it probably doesn't matter a lot which one comes first, but I'm just in the habit of, and maybe there's a reason for this, writing the smaller decay product second. So I'm going to put the symbol for the alpha particle, that little alpha symbol. And the nuclear notation for an alpha particle would be an atomic mass number of four, four protons, four, or sorry, two protons, two neutrons. And although it doesn't have a atomic number per se, it does have a charge number. So it has two protons in it. So we're gonna put the two down there. So that's the one of the decay products and that's the alpha particle. And so now we're just gonna play detective a little bit and figure out first of all, the numbers. So if you consider the top number, that's the uh, mass number. So law of conservation of mass is whatever we started with, 238 should be what we end with. Um, so we should have 238 when we're done. So if there's four here, that means we must have 234 here. 
Likewise, the charge has to be conserved. So we started with a charge of 90 true. Think of this as 92 protons, and there's two of the protons there. So our bottom number must be 90. So if you can add and subtract, you can usually figure out the product from uh, any given radioactive decay. In this case, it's whatever element has an atomic number of 90 and a total mass number of 234. So the mass number really doesn't tell us a heck of a lot. Be careful with that. It's really this that tells us 90, that tells us 90 protons. The only element on the periodic table has 90 protons is thorium. So that's our radioactive decay equation showing uranium-238 giving off an alpha particle and becoming this new, let's give this one a term, started with the parent, now we have the daughter nuclei. Um, yeah, so the daughter nuclei in this case is thorium-234. So hopefully you see the logic here. It's really just a matter of making sure all your numbers work out. You balance the, your nuclear reaction, just like you balance a chemical reaction. So if you get that, then the rest of these, whether you understand a whole bunch about nuclear physics or anything like that, become pretty straightforward. Thorium-234 undergoes a beta decay. There's an animation here. You can check it out for yourself. But that thorium that we ended up with before, Thorium-234-90 is going to undergo a beta decay. So I'm going to write the beta decay here, beta. Now, beta is interesting. Again, it says beta. We know that's beta negative. So that's negative one there. And a beta particle will have a zero up here. It's got zero mass. Not that the mass is nothing, but in terms of um, protons and neutrons, it has like a you know, a thousand times less mass than any of those. So we, for all intents and purposes, in this case, it's a zero. So working backwards, if we start with 90 protons and there's a negative one, better yet, 90 positive charges here, one negative charge here, that means we have to have a 91. 91 minus one gives us our 90 again. So that's our lower number, our charge number, if you want to think of it that way. And then the top number hasn't changed. 234 plus zero gives us our 234. So now the only thing left to do is look up on our periodic table what element this is. And the 91 tells us that this is protactinium. PA. All right. So um, again, I don't think the concept of law of conservation of mass, everything on the top at the beginning, equals everything at the top at the end. Everything that we started with for charge at the bottom has to be accounted for at the end. There's just one thing you have to remember with beta negative decay is beta negative decay is always accompanied, and for now just trust me on this one, by a particle called a antineutrino. Antineutrino. We, we'll see if we have time to revisit this. For now, it's just uh, something that you've got to remember to add when you get to beta decay. The antineutrino really comes uh, as a consequence of the fact that when this event occurs, when a beta particle is emitted one way, and they don't show that actually the antineutrino being produced here, it's interesting, but anyway, um, if the electron or the uh, uh, beta particle gets emitted one way, we need to conserve mass as well. And so there's a little antineutrino that goes this way. And the symbol for the antineutrino isn't exactly a V, it's kind of a scripted V that I'm trying my best to draw there, something like that. Um, but that's the antineutrino. And the, the bar on top, anything, and we'll see this later again, but this symbol right here, this little bar on top, refers to the anti-particle form of any particle. So this is an anti-neutrino. The symbol for neutrino is that little scripted V, and then the bar on top tells us that it's the anti-neutrino. And again, just trust me on this one for a little while. We can revisit this later when we talk a little more about anti-particles. All right, now I feel like it's just 
kind of redundant after a while. And even though we've never seen a beta positive decay, if you're given the initial parent nuclei, fluoride 18, so fluoride 18, the number of protons in fluoride is nine to start with. And if we know that it undergoes a beta positive decay, then later on we're gonna end up with this beta positive, positive one for the charge number, zero for the mass number. And we can now figure out that the bottom number here, the charge number or the uh, atomic number for this daughter nuclei will be eight. And on top, not much math necessary here. It's 18, just like we had before. So we look this up and it's oxygen 18, just like we see in the simulation over here. And again, there's another little piece of uh, material that we got to account for where in the previous beta decay, we had an antineutrino. When it comes to a uh, beta positive decay, we get the regular neutrino. So just a good old fashioned neutrino, not the antiparticle form of it. So just a little factoid you're going to have to remember whenever you write beta decay, you always have an anti neutrino. Whenever you have a beta positive decay, you get a neutrino. All right, one more just to say that we did one of every kind of uh, radioactive decay. Proactinium uh, 234 undergoes gamma decay. So let's do our same old thing. PA 234 on top, uh, 91 on the bottom, undergoes gamma decay. So gamma is like that. Gammas have no charge and no mass. Makes our life really easy. The top number still is 234. The bottom number is still 91. Ah, we still have proactinium, PA. So what's going on with gamma decay? What was the sense of that? Well, remember what I said. It's not necessarily the numbers of particles, number of protons, neutrons. It's more about their configuration. So in this reaction, this release of energy in the form of this photon, whoops, energy, the release of the energy, uh, I can spell energy, the release of this energy in the form of this photon allows this to become more stable. So um, you can kind of think of this the way I've been taught to understand it. It's much like when an electron goes from a high energy state to a lower energy state, it becomes less energetic, more stable. Imagine that the uh, protons and neutrons in here are just becoming more uh, to a ground state or they're just losing some energy, shifting in there, becoming more stable. So think of it that way. So all they do is release energy in the form of a photon. By the way, remember the energy of a photon is related to the frequency. And if we're going to talk about uh, the energy released when electrons go from a high energy state to a lower energy state, that's pretty small compared to this, these photons. These are going to be really high frequency, high energy photons. Um, so these things are going to be, well, clearly they're gamma. They're in the gamma spectrum. So way more than UV, way more than X-rays. They're in the gamma radiation Hulk making part of the spectrum. So we've talked about... Um, the idea of few things that have come together here. Nuclear, first of all, we talked about nuclear notation. And that's this idea that we can write the nuclear configuration, how many protons, how many neutrons, charges, masses, all that kind of thing, um, in order to communicate to people exactly which nucleus, which isotope we're talking about. Then we talked about the idea of different forces in the nucleus. Some forces are trying to rip apart this nucleus. Other forces are trying to keep it together. And it's this delicate balance that leads to some sort of nuclear stability where some nuclei, very stable, some not so stable. And so uh, because of that, we anticipate that just naturally over time, some nuclei will break apart and or they'll give off energy and they go through what we call a radioactive decay. And there was four decay particles that we looked at. 
the four decay particles were the alpha particle, the beta negative particle, the beta positive particle. Uh, we'll put that there. And then we had our gamma particle with no charge and no mass. And then we put those ideas together to write these nuclear reactions, which really come down to making sure that whatever you started with for mass at the beginning, when you had 234 in this case, then you better have 234 particles on top after. If you had 91 as your total charge at the beginning, then you better have 91 at the end. Some of them may be positive, some may be negative, but we can put them together to get the same amount that we started with. So hopefully uh, you can go back and take a look at some of this uh, and, and put it all together. But hopefully when it's done, you feel confident that when you do some sort of a nuclear notation, nuclear reaction, you're confident that you can write it out and predict the outcome. And we've done all the same things right now, but there's no reason why we couldn't uh, give you a different unknown. Uh, for example, you could be given the parent nuclei and the daughter nuclei, and then you have to predict what was the particle or particles given off. A couple little notes, of course, when it comes to beta negative, we have an anti-neutrino coming off with it. When it's uh, beta positive, we have a neutrino. Um, but if you remember those little factoids, then you should be good to solve pretty much any nuclear reaction. Oh, one last note. Every so often in physics 30, you will get a reaction and, oh man, I guess I could make one up here. Um, you will get a reaction, don't fact check me on this one, where you get some sort of a radioactive nuclei, like a radon, let's say 228. Um, and Oh, sorry, that's radium. Okay, radium 228. Let's say we got radium 228. And radium 228, let's imagine that, um, again, do not fact check me, but imagine that radium 228 becomes lead 220. So PB82 220. It is possible that when we are done, this thing can give off an alpha particle, but like a chemical reaction, it might be two alpha particles. So you'll see that in order to have our 228 for our mass number, we needed to have two times the alpha particles to get our total of 228. And in order to get our, oh dang, I might have done the math wrong, but you get the point. Oh shoot, I should have done something a little different. Anyway. Um, yeah, sorry about that. I guess I should have made this, what, 84. This should have been not lead. Uh, this should have been polonium, P-O. But you get the idea. Had we started with radium and produced polonium through an alpha decay, if you knew it was an alpha decay, then that radium, 228, becoming polonium, the only way we can kind of sleuth this or be a detective about this and if somebody told us it definitely gives off an alpha particle then you'd say well it's not just giving off one alpha particle it's giving off two alpha particles and now we have our law of conservation of mass law of conservation of charge everything's working out we still have our 228 on top we still have our 84 and two times two is four is 88 on the bottom so anyway sometimes you'll get this multiples of a radioactive decay particle. So be on your toes for that. For the most part, it's usually just one, but you'll see a couple every once in a while that are like that. All right, enjoy nuclear notation, decay products, nuclear decay, and writing nuclear equations.